You're listening to ReachMD, the channel for medical professionals. Welcome to GI Insights, where we cover the latest clinical issues, trends, and technologies in gastroenterological practice. GI Insights is brought to you by AGA Institute. Your host for GI Insights is Professor of Medicine and Director of the Digestive Disease Center at the Medical University of South Carolina, Dr. Mark DeLegge. What are the dangers of Barrett's esophagus and what are the most effective therapies for treating the condition? Joining us to discuss Barrett's and esophageal cancer is Dr. Donald Costell, Professor of Medicine and Director of the Esophageal Disorders Program at the Medical University of South Carolina in Charleston, South Carolina. Welcome, Don. Well, thank you very much, Mark. It's a pleasure to be with you. Don, we're here to talk about Barrett's esophagus, so to get right to the point, what is Barrett's esophagus and how common is it? Well, Norman Barrett in 1950 described changes in the mucosal lining of the distal esophagus so that it looked like stomach. That is, there was a columnar epithelium present there. Now, that's basically the definition, but that's been refined over the years so that most people today look for what's called intestinal metaplasia. That is, a columnar epithelium with goblet cells present in the lower part of the esophagus. Well, how common is it? Studies would indicate that if you take a group of patients with heartburn, chronic heartburn symptoms of of reflux, that about 15% will show these histologic changes, believed to be secondary to the long-standing acid exposure. Interestingly, in studies where patients who did not complain of heartburn were endoscoped at the time of a screening colonoscopy, they also found that between 10 and 15% of these people had these Barrett's changes. So it's believed that silent reflux may be going on in a small proportion of the population. But that number, about 15%, holds up pretty well. So, Don, does that mean that GERD or reflux of something is the cause of Barrett's? That's probably one of the beliefs that most people in the world hold pretty dearly. So if you wanted to get consensus anywhere among the Barrettologists, if you will, they would tell you, yes, this is a secondary lesion caused by chronic reflux disease. For the diagnosis of Barrett's esophagus, as a gastroenterologist, how am I making the diagnosis? Well, the only way to really get at least the beginning of your diagnosis is to look at it. You know, I wish I could tell you otherwise, that is, and hopefully we'll talk about some of the the risk factors and the things that may predict the possibility of Barrett's. But in fact, you know, to know it's there, you've got to do an endoscopy. you got to look at it, and I, and I always like to make the point that the diagnosis of Barrett's is suspected by the endoscopic appearance and confirmed by the biopsy appearance. Tom, when we're making that diagnosis, I know in the past there's been this differentiation between short Barrett's and other Barrett's. Is that a real differentiation? Yes and no. (laughs) The yes being that it's based on the extent that the Barrett's extends up the lower esophagus. And when Barrett first described his patients, As you might imagine, they had very extensive changes. Over the years, people decided that you couldn't call it Barrett's unless there were at least three centimeters of a distal esophagus lined by columnar epithelium. But then once the diagnosis was expanded to include the presence of intestinal metaplasia per se, then shorter segments, that is less than three centimeters, were characterized as Barrett's in a, in a landmark paper by Stuart Speckler in Lancet in the late 90s. So we now accept, yeah, there are the longer segments, that is, greater than three centimeters, but there can be shorter segments. So they're different, but the yes part, the answer to your question is that they're the same in that they both carry a malignant potential. So with all the endoscopies that we do in patients with reflux, we're looking for Barrett's. What's our concern about the abnormality? Well, our concern is exactly what I just mentioned. That is that we do know that the intestinal metaplasia, the metaplastic changes, can go on to develop dysplastic or dysplasia, and that can go on to adenocarcinoma. So Barrett's is a precursor, as we understand it today, 
to adenocarcinoma in the esophagus. Now, when you're sitting in your office and you're evaluating a patient or perhaps in the endoscopy suite, is there a group that's at the greatest risk for developing Barrett's and, and then perhaps adenocarcinoma? Absolutely. There are now accepted clear risk factors. The primary risk individual is a white male over the age of 50. And that's been known very well. And, that's, and unfortunately, it's probably also hard to get those people in for endoscopy. But this is the group that really needs to be screened, you know, so much so that there's been some interest in now that we've convinced these men to come in for their screening colonoscopy over the age of 50, let's take a quick look at the upper esophagus while they're being evaluated. So maleness, Caucasian race, duration of reflux symptoms, let's say greater than 10 years, Age of the patient, I already mentioned the over 50. These are definitive risk factors for the possible presence of Barrett's and, by the way, for the potential for the development of adenocarcinoma. Don, if, if a patient has heartburn, we'll say for years, versus somebody else who says, I've had these symptoms for six months, the person who's complaining of long-term heartburn symptoms, is that the one I need to be concerned about with cancer? Yes, by and large. Again, that's one of the risk factors that's been identified, the longer duration of symptoms. But, you know, you have to factor that against the observation that has been made over the years that once people develop these metaplastic changes, then they lose their sensitivity to the acidic reflux. So there's less acid sensitivity. So in some people, the symptoms may actually tend to lessen when the Barrett's develops. If you're just tuning in, you're listening to GI Insights and ReachMD, the channel for medical professionals. I'm your host, Dr. Mark DeLegge, and joining me to discuss Barrett's and esophageal cancer is Dr. Donald Castell, Professor of Medicine and Director of Esophageal Disorders Program at the Medical University of South Carolina. Don, I hear a lot about people performing screening or surveillance. Is there a difference between these two words? A tremendous difference, Mark, and I... I think that the medical community needs to think about these concepts. If I know you have Barrett's, I've done an endoscopy and identified Barrett's esophagus, then I'm going to put you in a, a surveillance program. That means I'm going to regularly perform an endoscopy with appropriate number of biopsies, looking for any early changes, pre-malignant changes like dysplasia, or even the presence of an early cancer. So surveillance is the follow-up of patients with known Barrett's. Screening is believed to be more important. Screening is trying to take that population at risk. Some of those factors we talked about take the patients at risk, particularly those with long-standing heartburn, and do an endoscopy looking for the presence of Barrett's. And the argument is that when you talk to gastroenterologists about finding a cancer in a patient with Barrett's, most of them will say that, gee, I do a lot of surveillance, but it's a rare day when I actually find a malignant change. On the other hand, people walk in my office with dysphagia that have never been screened before, and they are the ones that I find the cancers in. So the concept of getting the patients in who are at risk Doing those screening endoscopies is really where I think we should place our emphasis. What I'm hearing from you is that screening's very important. When I have somebody who has reflux symptoms who presents to my office as a gastroenterologist now, should they be screened with endoscopy for Barrett's? And let's just say it's normal and they continue to have reflux. Should I do it again in a few years? That's one of the questions that the Barrett's experts argue about repeatedly. And just as a quick answer to that question, many people now say, no, a once-in-a-lifetime endoscopy is sufficient. But then you've got to modify that. If I know that you have heartburn and I'm suspecting Barrett's and you're over the age of 50 and I do the endoscopy and there is no Barrett's, I probably do not ever have to do one again. That's the once-in-a-lifetime phenomenon. Because we know that most people who have Barrett's will have developed it by age 50. 
On the other hand, what do I do if you're only 25? Or as I saw the other day, a college student from here in Charleston, age 21, with severe chronic reflux and no Barrett's esophagus, what do I do with that patient? I probably need to screen them again in four to five years. But nobody knows the right answer to that question. When you're doing these screening or surveillance procedures, you know, how should they be performed? Is it going in there and taking a couple biopsies or is it more complicated than that? Well, as you might imagine, it's more complicated than that. But they, again, that's a great question. How many biopsies is enough? You know, you've got, let's say you've got six centimeters of Barrett's, a long segment, if you will, of Barrett's, and you're taking a little tiny pinch biopsy. People have often said it's like, taking a small shovel full of dirt from a football field. So your chances of missing dysplasia just by a sampling error are huge. So basically what's been recommended in what's often called the Seattle Protocol because of the studies being done at the University of Washington, but what's often recommended is within that six centimeters of Barrett's, I'm going to take four quadrant biopsies every centimeter until I get away from the Barrett's. Now, that's a lot of biopsies. That's a lot of blood. That's a difficult field to see, and many people find that essentially impossible to do. So they will do try to do the four quadrants every two centimeters within the Barrett's area and then make sure when they go back for the next surveillance endoscopy that they do a, numerous, a great number of biopsies again. So... This is not a three-minute endoscopy. Oh, my golly, no. It's a real job, and it's an important job, and the gastroenterologists really need to just roll up their sleeves and say, okay, I've got to do at least a reasonable approach to all of this tissue, get enough samples so we can talk about it. Don, I know you've done just a tremendous amount of work on non-acid reflux, perhaps diagnosed by impedance. Do you think that non-acid reflux as compared to acid reflux could also be a cause of Barrett's? Again, another very controversial area. In fact, while I'm on this subject, let me just make the point that there is a huge amount of controversy about Barrett's and everything we're talking about here. Reaching consensus among the world's experts is difficult, and this certainly is one of them. Most of us believe that Barrett's is a disease caused by acid exposure. Most of us believe that if you can reduce that acid exposure, that the patients will do well. In fact, there's some pretty good data now emerging that if somebody is on good chronic acid suppressive therapy, that the length of their Barrett's will shrink over time and even the rate of dysplasia will go down. Walter Reed, Dr. Wong's group, had a paper just in the American Journal of Gastroenterology this past year that showed that over time, people on PPIs, that the length of the Barrett's decreased and many of the short segment lesions were no longer apparent. From Tucson, from Sam Pleaner's group, there's evidence that the dysplasia rate goes down if you keep the acid under control. I'd like to thank my guest from the Medical University of South Carolina, Dr. Donald Castell. Dr. Castell, thank you very much for being our guest this week on GI Insights. It was a pleasure on my part, and thank you very much for allowing me to share this time with you. You've been listening to GI Insights on ReachMD, the channel for medical professionals. GI Insights is brought to you by AGA Institute. For additional information on this program and on-demand podcasts, visit us at ReachMD.com and use promo code AGA.